Waterhouse, and this is Lauren Mulheim, and we, together with Melissa Cohen, are co-chairs of the FBT Special Interest Group within the Academy for Eating Disorders. I want to thank both FEAST, the FEAST Planning Committee, and also the Academy for Eating Disorders for supporting this panel discussion, which is live. We have almost 230 Academy for Eating Disorders clinicians tuning in to learn from our parent panel. Right now, I'm gonna have each of our parents give a brief introduction to themselves. Hi, my name is Lisa Khan. My daughter is 20 years old. She was diagnosed as 17, almost 18, her senior year of high school. And she, um, from the beginning, we embarked on outpatient treatment. Uh, we were immediately referred to a doctor, an eating disorder doctor, who told us to start feeding her. So I got on the Peace website and, uh, and uh, started working with the great parents on their own dinner table forum. And they coached me, and I fed her using magic plate. And um, she has had, you know, we, we, it was not easy, but we've done well. Um, we also got support from uh, a six-month ACT, that's acceptance and commitment therapy program at a university. Uh, we're part of a research protocol there that was very helpful. And she's currently engaged with a DBT center that's doing full DBT. So very helpful. <coughs> My name is Lisa uh, Laborde. There are two Lisas on the panel, so that might be something that causes eating disorders, right? Um, <laughs> uh, my daughter was 10 at diagnosis, and she is 13 now. Uh, her presentation was pretty acute and, and a de rapid decline, so she was inpatient for eight weeks. And then we did follow up with the uh, hospital uh, treatment team um, for about a, a year. We had a year of FBT with um, pediatric and adolescent ED specialists through their program. She is doing fairly well now. Uh, she had a good year and a half of firm, firm um, remission recovery, doing well. And then <clears throat> this past September, she started new school, had a spike in anxiety, and a lot of eating disorder behaviors returned. But we caught it early, and we're on the outside, or the better side of a relapse now. Um, so we're doing well, but we're still working with our therapist, the FBT therapist. We resumed working with them once she relapsed. My name is Alec Rodney, and my daughter is 14 now. She was 12 at the time she was diagnosed with restricting anorexia. She's also had some exercise compulsion. Um, we initially sought treatment through a university-based par partial hospitalization program, and that was FBT, and had good success with that. Got her to the point where she could go back to school and participate sort of in her real life, as she calls it. And pretty quickly working with an outside therapist we just who was not FBT trained, but trying to do it, uh, sort of saw a slow decline, then it hit a rapid decline to the point that we put her in a residential program that wasn't FBT. She got out of that, was just uh, still exhibiting a lot of eating disorder behaviors, and we went back to the university-based uh, FBT program, and she's now just recently really turned a corner, and we feel like we have a hold on um, where she needs to go, and I think she has a hold Thank you. So we um, received a lot of uh, suggested questions, and we apologize in advance that we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try to get through as many as we can. So the first question we have for our panelists is, what three pieces of information do you wish your clinician had told you at the first session? How about I just share one, and everyone else can share one. Um, I think it's just understanding what the length of treatment is going to be. If you start reading about FBT and, and you read the literature about the positive outcomes, it looks like, oh, maybe in a year we could be beyond this. And your thinking gets caught in that. Well, you know, she's young, we caught it early, we can get out of this quickly. And I think that just having expectations about how long the treatment process could be 
maybe the therapy itself only goes for a one year cycle, but understanding that the treatment may take many more years. Um, our first uh, clinician contact was with a pediatrician, and um, I was told, I noticed something was up. I couldn't really define what it was, but something wasn't right with my daughter, and, and then there was months of tummy aches and not eating, so I took her to the pediatrician. And what I wish that they had done at that point was not look at her and give me a general sense of, well, generally her BMI is good, generally she looks healthy, but looked at her specific trajectory and growth curve and realized that she had dropped off of that. Because I took her home thinking, you know, I have this endorsement of it's okay, even though I knew something was up. And we lost months because they hadn't actually looked to see where her growth was and how far she'd fallen. So I wish that they had checked that out initially and told us that. And the second thing is that you can feed your child. Even if she's saying no, food is medicine. If they said to me that right away, um, we would have lost a lot of time and it would have given me, I think, um, some clear direction at a point when I didn't have any. And I have the same experience with Alex that I, uh, that with Alex that I would have liked to have understood that um, we're not going to get her weight restored and then be cured. Uh, now I understand that there's more involved and it's taken me a few years to understand that, and even this conference is making me understand it better. But I also, um, I, I wish that I had uh, known at the beginning not to be afraid of what ED is afraid of, and which means that, and I, I wish my doctors were not afraid for me. So I think that they were responding to, to my anxiety by not giving us a high enough weight range. So if I could have started off thinking that I had to move my daughter into a whole new category that, of weight that she really had not been in before, I might, we would, would have had, um, uh, well, probably, I, I would think maybe at this point we would have a little bit of a more solid recovery. So this is where I'm moving at this point. We're gonna start moving into a higher weight range because uh, my daughter is currently experiencing a relapse that <coughs> was triggered by um, going back to college and taking um, stimulant medications, which caused a few pounds to drop off and then caused her mind to follow. So um, I wish I had known from the beginning that we should move her up a little higher. Thank you. Um, next question. What is the most helpful thing your various team members said to you, and what is the least helpful thing they said to you? I think the most helpful thing that our team said to us was, understanding that that weight restoration goal it's if their mental state doesn't turn around it may not turn around right away but you can tell if they're under if there's underweight and they're not turning around at all that you just have to keep pushing it up and i think understanding that there's no great science to figure out that perfect number or range but you have to start seeing some other signs of recovery before you, you know, let off the accelerator i think that that was probably the most helpful Um, we, we, we were so fortunate that as soon as we recognized there was a problem, we were sent to an eating disorder specialist who told me before we even got to see her, start feeding her. So that day, I began feeding her, and although it was difficult, within a week or two, we could see her turning around, recovering, and becoming uh, her mind matching uh, where she should be in life. So um, I felt very fortunate that I had that advice. <coughs> uh, I guess I, I would say the most helpful thing was um, the clear message that, that nutritional rehabilitation is the most important thing and that not eating was not an option. And it's not that we hit that mark every single day. We didn't. Um, there were some days we really struggled with that, and, or I struggled with it as a parent. But that was a very clear goal that was reinforced by our clinicians and by the team. So then what we talked about then was how to get there. Like, what are the pieces? What are the particular challenges? But this is the goal, and we're standing behind your mother in supporting that goal and reaching that goal. So it was a clear message that was helpful. Anything least helpful you want to add? <laughs> Just really quickly, when we transitioned away from our initial program and working with a private therapist, is taking the eye off of the eating disorder and off of how important weight gain is, especially for an adolescent who's still developing, 
um, and changing the focus to anxiety, which obviously was a big issue for my daughter also, but taking that focus off, that was the least helpful thing for sure. Our initial, um, the pediatrician said, don't be the food police, and that, that was not helpful because it was said in front of my child, and then I heard it for about five months later. <laughs> How soon in the process did you see signs of recovery and what were those signs? But as I said before, um, it, it, I saw change pretty quickly. Um, initially when we were refeeding her, she had to sleep all day long because she couldn't face or bear what was happening to her. And she was imagining that her thighs were growing monstrous in front of her. And, um, within a week or two, she started to get out of bed and wake up and participate in life and, and, and kind of accept what was going to happen. Uh, you know, with therapy over the next year and, and FBT support, we um, had lots of running away and screaming and fighting and yelling. And she was a screamer and it was not easy, but it was all doable and she was basically participating. Uh, because she was impatient, it's hard to answer how soon in the process we saw recovery because she became fairly compliant fairly early in the hospital. She ate with the nurses, she ate with staff. Um, she refused to eat with me though the entire time she was in there. So um, we saw compliance with weight gain in the hospital and with consistency. Um, she knew what was expected and, and it, it happened six times a day and we saw increases in um, her engagement in the world in the hospital. But then during the transition, that was very difficult and, and it was like we stepped back hugely. <coughs> so I would say when I started to see progress at home was um, with increased weight, but also the more consistent I got, the more progress I saw. So once I sort of hunkered down and realized this is it, we're in it, surrender to it, be a brick wall and just support her through it and expect her to eat or, and try to do that. And then I would say um, we started to see compliance fairly quickly. Um, and then her sense of humor started to come back and that's when we really realized we turned a corner. And that was a good five or six months in where she would spontaneously laugh about something. And for us, since she started out in a PHP, a partial hospitalization program, um, we would see sort of two different people. We'd hear how great she's doing inpatient, and then she'd come home at night, and we'd have our dinner, and it would be this explosion every night. And that lasted for a good two or three weeks, and um, eventually we didn't wear down, well, at least not in front of the eating disorder. And that's when we started seeing progress. Um, it was slow progress. It was There was still lots of negotiating, lots of um, butting heads, but we insist that she eat everything, and the good thing is our daughter's sort of her personality is being very compliant, so eventually her personality was coming out and, and wanting to please, and she would, she would eat everything, but it wasn't easy, and it, it did take, take a good three weeks to a month before we sort of saw you know, those behaviors not completely eradicated, but definitely manageable. Um, I, I, I just want to say that I saw an immediate change with, with nourishment, but it wasn't for a good eight months until my da daughter started to sing again. And, you know, just sing around the house to herself and out loud, um, something she did all the time and completely stopped. So it took about eight months for that to come back. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that implementing FBT at home is pretty challenging. Could each of you discuss briefly what were the most challenging aspects of implementing FBT for you and also the rest of your family? So going back to those first three weeks, it's the most difficult thing is really having to deal with that, uh, you know, Ed and, and then sort of that little demon that's in front of you and disassociating that from your daughter. Um, I think that was probably the most challenging part. And then I have a son who is a couple years older than my daughter and getting him to buy in that he had to be part of the process. And he turned out to be a huge help in being a great mealtime distraction. Um, but getting him on board, 
you know, it's like, why should I do this? He was a teenager himself, and it's, you know, he didn't willfully, you know, go into the process, but um, eventually embraced it. So I think that was just the whole change in the family dynamics was the, the big issue. Um, I would say that the isolation was overwhelming. Um, so even though my, the clinicians understood to a certain extent what it was that we were going through, um, nobody, the family dynamic had changed so completely, um, and none of my friends, they got it, and they were empathetic and supportive as they could be, but they weren't living it, and the isolation <coughs> was overwhelming, because it's so disorienting. Everything changed, right? The child that I thought I knew changed. Um, all the old parenting skills that I thought I had weren't working anymore, um, so I felt disoriented and isolated, and I think if I'd not found some outside peer support, had I not found around the dinner table, I honestly don't know, um, I mean it sounds melodramatic, but I don't know how I would have been able to do it. Uh, I single parented for parts of it, um, and I would be on the forum asking questions and getting some the roadmap, really, of, of how it could play out, um, and that was really helpful. So I think the isolation was, was very, very difficult. When my daughter was diagnosed, I, I think many people could probably relate to the feeling of um, complete and utter panic, and I had physical symptoms. My respiration rate was so fast. My heart was pounding. Even she and I went to a movie together, and I was sitting there, and I didn't even, I was distracted by the movie, I didn't even know it, and she said, Mom, you're breathing so fast, and I really thought I would collapse. So um, I went to an individual therapist who taught me mindful, me mindful meditation, mindful meditation, and uh, I studied John Kabat-Zinn's book, and I practiced meditation, breathing, calming myself, and uh, also it helped me to train my thoughts so that when my Thoughts went into the future, into fear, into desperation, anxiety. Uh, I could use that mindful meditation to say, is the, are these thoughts useful in this moment as my daughter's trying to run into traffic? No, I have to stay in this moment and deal with this moment. And so this training was paramount for me. So what did therapists or other clinicians do that helped you stay motivated to persist in continuing with FBT throughout some of those most difficult moments, throughout the hardest times during treatment? I think the most important thing that they said is, we're the experts in our child. And they see your child, you know, depending on the, the setting, maybe several hours a day if they're an inpatient or partial hospitalization or it's once a week if they're an outpatient, and they see the version the child, the child chooses to bring to that <coughs> setting, whereas we see them all the time. And having a sit in an FPT session and my daughter here, that we're the experts, was a huge asset to us in, in the whole process. <coughs> Um, well, the hardest parts, I guess, were when it seemed like we weren't making um, any headway or that we'd lost traction. So uh, strategizing around how to close loopholes, like strategizing around keeping the clear goal consistent and strategizing around that with her and with me. Well, actually strategizing with me because she sat in a ball in the corner for about six months and didn't speak to anybody in the, in the treatment. But strategizing with me around that um, and dealing with the practical considerations that I had. Um, so oftentimes it wasn't that the big picture was a problem for me, it wasn't that I, I didn't really know how to do it, it was the details of the how, like how, can, if I'm working on my own, how can I take time off and still be able to pay my mortgage and feed my child? So FBT was set up that um, we had joint sessions, so what was helpful for them to do at times was to split that, so they weren't doing manualized, but in order for me to be able to express some of my particular concerns and not do it in front of my daughter, they were able to adapt it for us and that helped us through some of the difficult sessions. And I, because we did um, ACT treatment that was meeting weekly with our therapist, my husband and I would meet for an hour and then my daughter would meet with the same therapist for an hour. 
So we had separated treatment, and for me personally, for my family, that is the only way that it could have worked because um, the things we had to express would have, would have caused such um, inflammatory behaviors in my daughter that we could not have been in the same room together. And this way, she, she was able to work with a the therapist and be validated and uh, feel strong and capable and confident and, and encouraged, and we were able to express that the difficulties we were having and were given advice and guidance, and that type of treatment worked very well for us in my family. Okay. Um, what long-term positive and or negative effects have there been on your whole family, including sibling relationships, spouse and significant other relationships? So just thinking long-term, do you see any positive or negative overall effects? I only see positive. Um, uh, my, it, we, we engaged in, in treating my daughter, and then a year later I was diagnosed with cancer. And the only thing I could think was, please don't let this derail my daughter. And, um, you know, there were, of course, very hard times and a lot of strife. And uh, I didn't think my daughter could ever like me again. But two years later, she wrote me a letter. 40 reasons why she loves me, and she ended with, thank you for taking the time to learn about this illness, to learn about how to treat me, and to help me. And so, you know, I can only say good has come, become closer. And my husband and I have um, united, it was not easy. It was very hard for him to learn the way I was able to learn, by going online, by seeking information. He didn't really want to believe what I had to share with him. But with time, with him engaging the professionals, he was able to come around and we work as a unit. Um, and it get only gets, that has only gotten stronger where I really could not have seen that that would have happened. But he continues to be an ally and uh, it's great. Um, positive, uh, positive of um, treatment? I, I can't, there is nothing that I would say is come positive out of this, other than we were connected to a great treatment team. Um, she was 10 at diagnosis and, and is only 13 now. And I still, she doesn't really have a clear sense of what happened. She doesn't have a real sense of being able to process it. Um, I think it feels to her like her brain just turned on her one day. Um, she still won't admit that, that she's got an eating disorder as she's ditching food. She'll say, I'm fine. So I think maybe with age, there may be some insight, and with the tools that she may be learning around distress tolerance, in time, she may be able to incorporate that. Um, I think, you know, I mean, you do what you do, and if you can be supported through it, I think it's just all part of whatever the journey is you have, but uh, I can't really think of a positive. And I'd say we've seen some positive and some negative in terms of sibling relationships. She and her brother, they always they had always been best friends. They, the eating disorder sort of tore them apart, but I think as she's become more recovery-minded, we're seeing them come back together, and we're seeing my son have a better understanding of the struggle that she goes through, that it's not just about, well, why can't she just eat? Um, so that's positive. I think, you know, from a spousal point of view, it's the most difficult thing that my wife and I have had to do ever and, and being on the same page, same book, same page, same line all the time and trying to focus only on that. We've got a lot of other things going on in our life. It's been difficult. We've been a great team with, with in terms of treating the eating disorder, sometimes dealing with other things, not so much. Um, and then the one thing we've seen a negative thing is my daughter has really isolated quite a bit and we live really close to my mom, and seeing her, she used to have this great relationship with her grandma, and she's really pulled away from that, and we're just starting to see her come back to that, so that's a good sign, but it's, it, you know, it's, I understand, you know, how meaningful it is to have grandparents in your life, and you push them away, that's just hard to see. What do you feel is the best tool you received from your treatment team to add to your toolbox in helping your son or daughter battle their eating disorder? 
the NG tube. Um, <laughs> I love the NG tube. Um, my, as I said, my daughter didn't, she, could, she wouldn't eat with me while she was in the hospital. That was something she was unable to do until she left. Um, and, you know, that's when I finally got onto the form, the, around the dinner table form, and, and asked, like, how do I do this? Because they were saying, well, we can release her having not eaten with you, and you can manage it at home. And I thought, no, that's not possible. Like, keep her until she's 18, please. Um, <laughs> but, and, and I got coached through by, um, you know, some godsend parents to say, they have to treat you like they treat the staff. You have to be staff, and, and you're gonna have to get over this anxiety, and it's anxiety, and all of that. And I went back, and I said that to them, and then they started to do that. Um, I gave them an example of, would you, what would they do if, if she refused with the staff? And nutrition was not non-negotiable, so she would get the liquid replacement, nutritional replacement, and then it would be the NG tube, um, and that's what they implemented for me. And that is what allowed her to be able to tell the eating disorder, I have to do this, knowing that the NG tube was our backup. I'm not certain how we would have managed without that. There were, when we, she was first released, I called the hospital almost every day to set it up. We only had to do it um, once. Well, we had to do it twice in one day. Um, but we didn't often have to use it, but she needed in the, initially to know it was there. So having the treatment team um, listen to me, uh, and then go away and really think about what it means when you say nutrition is not negotiable, what that means and how we're gonna adapt it for this family. And what it meant was that while you're home, you will phone the hospital, if she's missed a meal, they will set up the NG tube and for the next meal she'll be down there. And that is what allowed us to, to move forward. I don't know if I'm exactly answering the question, but I, I don't think I could, could have done this without the parents at the other end of my computer who would coach me on a daily basis. Um, uh, some of the parents put together some videos that are available online. They're called C and M Productions, and I watched those videos because they informed me. They let me know what it was supposed to look like, that what, what was happening in the home with my daughter, what was it supposed to sound like, what was I supposed to say? It gave me the words, it gave me the vision, and um, that is what got us through. And I'm not sure if this is a tool, but I think it's a bit of advice, and it's, you have to put out all the embers before you eradicate this eating disorder. And I think our first go around, <coughs> we taught me to put out most of the fire, but there were definitely embers there. And my daughter was able to fake it through once a week sessions, either individual or family therapy sessions, that you know, for an hour she can say anything you want her to say, and she says she's gonna go home and do homework and, and work on things, and she doesn't do it. And with those embers there that the heat is sort of flare up, we just realized now you gotta put out the whole fire, and you know, just like a firefighter has to put out every ember before they know that that fire's not gonna come back. How did it feel not to be told exactly what to feed your child and how to respond to refusal to eat? For example, the non-directive approach. I mean, it's, I, I'd say it's frightening as hell when you first get up there. It's like, okay, really? I, you know, I have to figure this out myself. And again, empowering, being empowered that you're the expert on your child and you know what to feed them. You've been feeding them for their first, in, in my case, you know, we were feeding her for her first 12 years of life successfully, why can't we continue? And just, um, it was very anxiety provoking. It's, and then getting that response when the eating disorder just rages at you, it's like you wanna back down. But I think when you have a treatment team that's telling you just stick with that, it's going to get better. And if you go on around the dinner table and you hear that from countless other people, you know, everyone who does their first time post and says, I just started treatment, they all get that same response, just stick with it. And even though it is anxiety provoking for the parents, I think you realize in your gut, well, I gotta at least stick with it and see if it gets better, and it does. It, I, I think in almost every case, it always gets better. Sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it manifests itself in other ways that uh, you, know, you see some other behaviors, but um, it's empowering, and I think once the child and the eating disorder see you're empowered, 
things do get better. I would just echo that um, it is a confidence booster. I mean, I remember when we were leaving the hospital and I went to the dietitian and I said, oh, I need a meal plan. And she said, no, you know how to feed your child. And I'm looking around at the hospital thinking, I'm in the hospital, I clearly don't know how to feed my child. <laughs> so, um, but she said that and on a, around the dinner table there's a great saying which is fake it until you make it. And, and when they say you have to feed your child and we're not going to tell you how because you know how to do that, you go home and you fake it. Um, what was helpful for me was for them to give me an outside sort of marker, try to aim for X amount of pounds a week so that I could then, with our own menu and how I cooked, figure out what I needed to, to match that. And I think my fear had been so high that had they given me something, my anxiety would have latched onto that. So it was actually um, empowering and a confidence booster, <coughs> though I didn't see it at the time. I have always loved to cook and feed my family. It's pretty much what I what I do while I'm on this earth, I think. But um, my daughter was a disordered eater from birth, and she ate such small quantities that it was very hard. It took me several months to kind of, I actually couldn't understand how much she needed. So I was not able to give her enough until I planned meals the night before in secret, counting the calories, so that I knew that I was actually giving her enough because my mindset was different from what she needed. So I needed that external. I didn't have a nutritionist or a dietitian to help me. Um, our doctor said I didn't need it, but I was able to figure it out on my own uh, what kind of quantity and, uh, and calorie density I needed to provide for her. So I think we all find our own way. Some people are more intuitive. I needed to be a little more structured. So our next question is, did you tap into additional resources, books, support groups, um, and if so, what was most helpful? And several of you have already made reference to Feast and Around the Dinner Table, but there may be clinicians um, watching who are not so familiar, so maybe you, um, if you use those, you can you know, describe them a little more. Well, I think um, I'll get back to Around the Dinner Table in a minute or a few seconds. Um, I read a couple of books right up front. Um, Harry Brown's book, and I'm... Brave Girl Eating. Brave Girl Eating, thank you. Um, was really helpful because it's, as I was reading it, I'm like, did she just write this book about my daughter? Because mm -hmm. the, there are so many symptoms that are, you know, across with, especially with anorexics, that they just all exhibit a lot of classic symptoms. And so reading a book like that, it's like, okay, you know, I feel like I see what the path ahead of me is. And then finding around the dinner table, it's just a great parent-to-parent -parent resource. And I think, you know, if you're dealing with clients, if anyone can benefit from it because there's all sorts of threads. And if you don't want to take the time <coughs> to read through the threads, it's a, it's a um, community where if you just throw a, a question out there, it's not like someone's going to say, oh, well, you got to go find this thread and go read it. People start answering the questions. And you have people who have thousands and thousands of posts on there, which means they've read probably tens of thousands of posts. And it's this really um, embrace the, 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 the community just embraces you right away. And to feel that as a parent is huge because I think most of us feel the isolation in our own community because people don't understand eating disorders, people, especially anorexia, they, they, they seem to think that it's a definite disease of choice still, when you talk to lots of moms of high schoolers, uh, I won't say just moms, parents of high schoolers. So I think um, having that resource was really important, and then just reading as much as possible um, about what the condition is, and there's lots of good, and Beast puts out lots of great literature, and I think I've read everything that they've put out. So FEAST is the organization that has sponsored this conference and it stands for Families Empowered and Supporting Treatment of Eating Disorders. And it's basically a group that supports families in their endeavors to help their, their uh, loved ones. And, um, and then uh, Around the Dinner Table is an online forum that is an outgrowth from FEAST. So those things have been you know, tremendous for me. Um, then I also loved reading Brave Girl Eating by Harriet Brown, 
and uh, Laura Collins wrote Eating with Your Anorexic, uh, which was also tremendous for me for the same reasons of recognizing my daughter and saying I'm not alone. There are other people who have had this same exact experience. Um, reading An Anorexia Decoded, a more recent book by Carrie Arnold, has really helped me to understand the disorder. And of course, Help Your Teenager Beat an Eating Disorder by Locke and LaGrange. We call it the Bible. It will, it's uh, easy to read and it uh, gives you a tremendous understanding and foundation for, for knowing where you're going and what we're going to do. I just want to add, um, give food a chance to, to that list. It was one of the first books that I got, well, after going onto the internet and trying to read everything I could, it was one of the first books that was given to me. Um, and it was the first book that made sense to me, and it was what I gave most of my family members, because it was <coughs> an easy entry that it explained um, sort of the background, the medical piece, some of the brain piece, and treatment, uh, current treatment, and explained it in a way that was accessible to them. Um, and it was really helpful initially for me to, <clears throat> to separate the eating disorder from my child. What was helpful in that is to understand what was going on in the brain and to understand the um, science piece because it didn't. What I was seeing didn't make sense to me, and the only way through it. So initially, seeking out other resources, seeking out internet sites that were recommended by um, parents have on feast was truly, truly helpful in the beginning. The learning curve was steep. Uh, but it was calming. It was calming. It felt like I was doing something. Okay. Um, is there anything that you think therapists, or for that matter, any clinicians, doctors, nurses, dietitians, really don't get about what goes on in a family with a child with an eating disorder um, that you would like clinicians to know? What do you really want to tell clinicians that they truly don't understand? I guess I, I guess I was fortunate because everyone we worked with got it completely. So I I, I have nothing to say about that. I think I just reiterate something I said earlier is that you know the therapist can sometimes are not seeing the same child that you're seeing and really having to especially if if the child's showing great signs of recovery. Um, you know, do what you can to probe, are you really in recovery or are you just faking it here in my office? I think, and, and that's a, a tough line to follow. I'm not saying that's easy, but um, that's probably the toughest thing uh, that, to understand with the family is we, we're living it seven days a week, sometimes 24 hours a day if the child's at home and we see everything. <coughs> Um, I, I would echo that and say parents are a wealth of information and that we want to work with you. We want to work with clinicians um, and that we do see you as members of a team and, and the goal is you know, our precious, most precious resource. So we're really willing and um, able to work with you and provide a lot of information. Uh, and, and I think to the clinicians that I first met, I would say to them, often like when you're filtering through what you're seeing, Sometimes it's a symptom and not a cause, and, and try to remember that. Um, and try to remember that when you're speaking I'm not to, sure I understand. to the parents. Um, so that's what, that's what I was saying. Okay. So how do you feel about implementing consequences or incentives to your child for not completing meals? How has that worked? Have you been coached to do that? When we started out in, uh, with our um, PHP program, one of the things we did is we worked on uh, a behavioral contract. And it was really foreign to us at the time. It's like, why would you, you know, have to put in the contract you know, what you want your daughter to do? But it was very effective, partly because my daughter is so, can be so <coughs> compliant and she's very goal-oriented. And so we had both rewards and consequences, rewards for eating everything, and, and for her it was giving her a little bit of more exercise. Uh, I think at the time we didn't realize how strong her exercise compulsion was, so we probably gave her a little too much incentive there, but we also gave her other incentives. Uh, and there were, the consequences is, you know, you can lose any of those incentives, and sometimes the consequences were more negative 
but we tried to keep it more positive based and it worked and the only downside for us is we went from a two being a two cat family to a three cat family. So <laughs> no more cat, no no more rewards with more cats. <laughs> Obviously, this is where parents are really, really helpful because each child is unique. I mean, they're broad strokes, and uh, we see similarities between our children. But we all we know their individual temperaments. Um, incentives didn't don't work w with my daughter. Disincentives sometimes work, making where she is more uncomfortable sometimes makes her move. But she likes it good incentive. Um, I mean, she likes to up the ante, so incentives really don't work. But we did. Um, implement uh, what we call uh, on the form what the parents would call life stops until you eat which is another reinforcement of um, nutrition is vitally important and we have to get that done first so we did find quite a bit of success with that but it wasn't presented as as a punishment or even a disincentive it was just presented as um, you know food is medicine we got to take the medicine before we do anything else um, so we did have some success with that And, and I also um, subscribe to life uh, stops before, you know, until you eat. I mean, they, they just, they, we would sit at the table, if it took hours, it would take hours. I mean, this was the priority. And um, I think because my daughter was older, she, her incentives were a little more broad in general. What do I want in life? What do I want to accomplish? Do I want to go to college? Do I want to have a job? Do I want to be able to socialize in a certain manner? Do I want independ independence? And this was all, all these things were contingent upon her eating and, um, and uh, working towards her goals of growing up. And she wanted to grow up, she wants to grow up. We're still working on this, she's 20, but she still um, looks forward to independence. She's living at home with us after um, some unsuccessful experience away at college. And she, she herself came home and said, I need to come home, I need to work on myself, and she's working towards the life that she wants, and that is the incentive for us. Okay, and I have an additional question, because we've gone through all of your initial set. Um, as you know, family-based treatment goes through three phases. Typically, the first phase being medical stabilization, nutritional rehab. Second phase, which can be difficult, um, and prolonged in some cases involves transferring some aspects of independent <coughs> eating back to the adolescent. And the third phase is getting on with your adolescent life. In phase two, do you have any advice or particular strategies that helped in transitioning to that little more independent eating? Okay, this is my phase two. Go slow. Right? I mean, I think progress is really intoxicating. And when you start in a very dire space where you are in phase one, the progress um, is intoxicating. And you can see it. And it's sort of concrete. And you're gaining weight. And then there's this amorphous phase two uh, where you're slowly handing back control. And I think as parents, we want life back to normal. Right? We want our children to be able to do what they've done. We want that for them. We want it for us. So. Um, there's, there's, I think, a propulsion towards moving forward and moving forward as quickly as is safe. And I think um, my experience has been that you need to really, really, really slow down in, in phase two um, and that that's okay um, and it's not a failure and it's not a straight line. So a step forward and a step back is still progress in the long term. So I think telling parents, or letting them understand by the time they get to phase two, that it's a long, to take a long view, um, and, and and not be worried about um, just hanging out there, because it will come, right? You're laying the base, because it's much, I, I, it's much better, I think, to do it slow and steady than having to do it over and over and over again. And sometimes you have to do it over and over and over again, too, right? And that's still, that's just the nature of it, so. <coughs> And I think for us, our, our first go around is phase two is where we, we went too fast and we transitioned things too fast and our daughter sort of fell off the cliff again. And now realizing she's still not a full grown young woman and she has a lot of growing left and we want to take it really slow because we, part of it is we see how anxiety provoking having decisions are on her 
just in other aspects of her life. So giving her food decisions just seems like a really, at this point, a foreign idea. And we're trying to give her a little bit of choice, but concrete choices so that she's not getting anxiety over that. So I think, you know, again, taking it slow and um, especially with the, the younger adolescents, it's like, you know, for them to try to stay ahead of a growth curve is just probably, uh, you know, asking way too much of them. So, and it's, it's asking a lot of us as parents to still be in control and, and do that. So I think it's, you gotta look at each child individually, but certainly take it slow. And uh, I concur, if I had a redo, I would have taken it much more slowly. My daughter was diagnosed in May. She did not go to school and college in September with her friends, but she did. we did send her in January, and that's only seven months. And I realize now that we should have given ourselves minimally a year. And we should have seen many, many more months of independent eating before we move forward. And even though parents on the other side of the computer advised me of that, it was very hard to believe. It was very hard. And even our, our professionals were encouraging her to move on very quickly. And uh, I wish I had taken it much more slowly. But, but there's always time. I mean, there's no, you know, this is not a, a, a disorder that you, you figure out right away. You, you make your mistakes, and then you course correct and try again and try something else and uh, keep working at it and that's what we're doing. We had some um, other questions from participants about the roles of um, dietitians and um, internists or pediatricians specifically. Um, so if you could talk about uh, your experience with um, you know, other members of the team and um, any suggestions uh, you have for those professions. We've, we've worked with our pediatrician and we've worked with the dietitian. And uh, I, I think our pediatrician, we had to sort of uh, help her get educated, uh, but she's a longtime pediatrician and she really has embraced being part of the solution with us. Um, we see her more regularly than we used to see her for the one time wellness visit, but uh, it's, I think, again, it's, sometimes it's upon the parents to educate the professional. Um, or at least get some good literature. There's some great literature that's being put out, um, both um, Feast, AD. There's all sorts of great literature out there. So I think you know, getting that into their hands. And then working with a dietitian, we sort of looked at that as a mixed, um, kind of a mixed sword. And it, it turns out with my daughter, it's like she can't trust us to be the experts if there's someone who is also giving her expert opinion. So we've found at this point in time, we can talk to a dietitian, but my daughter can't be any part of the process. Um, it just, it turns into a really um, unhealthy situation. So I think at some point she might be able to work with a dietitian when she gets to that point of independence, but right now it's like, we get the coaching behind the scenes. She may realize we're getting some coaching because we've made some changes that she might not expect, but if she doesn't see it, she's okay. And um, I found it was very helpful to have um, an adolescent medicine doctor, specialist in eating disorders, who um, was allied with us, that gave my daughter confidence that we were doing the right thing because the doctor, um, the, because we were allied with the doctor and she supported us and we supported her. Um, but, and we were told not to use a registered dietitian because because uh, my daughter was not, well, well, we were in charge of her. I mean, I could have, I could have um, consulted with one myself. But now that she's 20, and I'm hoping that she will soon um, be feeding herself, and I mean, which she has done for a, at least a year, but because of relapse, uh, she's going to have to relearn this. I realize now that she's going to need more structure. That she, her eating, her hunger and satiety cues might not come in and uh, soon, and. Um, uh, she might not. What, what, what's the term for knowing when you're hungry and knowing how much you should eat? Intuitive eating. Intuitive eating. Yeah. I, I thought that was going to come back, but I'm realizing it's not. So I assume that she's going to have to start working with a dietitian to um, structure her eating for her because I don't know. I'm not going to do it forever, and I and I, I don't think she's going to be able to do it without that support. So that's the direction where we will move. Uh, I just wanted to add. Um, uh, with our pediatrician, we struggled a little bit, um, and some of it was the conflict between the adolescent 
treatment model, uh, which is to give the child more and more independence and see them in individually uh, without the parent and, and listen to them. Um, and the FBT model, which uh, gives the parent and phase one a lot of control. So what would happen is we would do FBT, and when we were phasing out of FBT and we went back to our pediatrician, um, <clears throat> it was kind of a jarring shift to just seeing her alone and um, talking about to her about what her concerns were and not really understanding that some of those concerns or some of what she would be articulating would be through um, an eating disorder lens. So we had to, I had to work with her a little bit on that and it shifted, but it took a little bit of time. Okay, um, for those of you who were in, had inpatient experiences or experiences with residential care, um, or IOP, um, one of the things I've seen frequently that is very difficult is the transition from that more intensive care into full outpatient. Um, to me, I call it the big cliff. Um, could you, do you have any tips for clinicians on what helped ease that transition? Was anything helpful? Was a certain style of communication or was, did you feel adequately prepared in going from a higher level of care, alternative level of care into full outpatient? Prepared? Um, no, but that wasn't their fault. That was just the nature of it. So we went from inpatient to, um, we didn't do a step down program. We were inpatient, then she came home and we had weekly FBT sessions. And <clears throat> the plan B, having a very, very clear plan B, um, not for if something goes wrong, but when, right? Because there will be refusal. Uh, I mean, I'm sure sometimes there aren't, but, but for the most part there are. So being able to strategize and talk about that and being really clear with my daughter about what it was, uh, which didn't make it easier to implement, but we were all on the same page about what it was going to be, um, and that gave me some assurance. Um, the level of vigilance that's needed uh, is astronomical, and I think I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't have a sense that I really did have to watch her all the time. Right? I, I did have to pull her back into my bed. Um, I had to, it was like having a toddler again. So, and there's no way to prepare a parent for that, but having a very clear, I think, um, discussion about the reality, the truth. Like I needed the truth. I needed to know just how difficult it might be on a daily level uh, so that I could prepare myself. So I would say in transition planning, don't minimize it for parents. Don't give them a, a sense of, what the best case is, or maybe give them the best case, but plan for the worst so that they feel prepared. And we've, we've had multiple experiences with stepping down, and I think the most important thing that I would come away with it is the day that you're putting your child into an intense program should be the day you start planning for the aftercare. Because it takes, you need to be sure about that aftercare, and that for us was, our initial downfall is that we didn't really have a great aftercare plan in place. It, it worked for a while, but again, with, with a child who's still growing, it's, we got behind the curve. And then second time around, we had a, we, we sort of, when she did go into residential care, we did sort of s start talking about the process, and plan A didn't work, but plan B um, did end up working for us. But it's, it's having that plan being well in advance. I think if you wait until a couple weeks before discharge, there's just too many variables that you know you need to have in place, and, and that's um, it's very anxiety provoking for the parent. I can only imagine it's anxiety provoking for the child too. Okay, would each of you like to? Give one, give a few more final words of wisdom to our audience. I guess uh, a couple things that I didn't get to say that I, I think are important to say, and if you're a clinician, I think it's important to communicate to uh, to parents, especially if they're, you know, brand new. They they've just been the, the daughter's or son has just been diagnosed is one is making them understand that maybe radical intervention so for us we lived in san diego there's a great program right there that's you know it's it's a php program it's taking your child out of their normal life and putting them into an intensive program it's a radical thought and as a parent we were scared to do it at first and we realized we probably and eventually went there but we lost a few months and you know it's you don't want to lose any time and 
along those lines is you have to convince parents when they're fighting the eating disorder, they need to fight it just like as if their child was diagnosed with cancer, how they would fight it. And you don't do it at home, you don't do it alone, you don't think that you can fight this on your own. And that's, again, because of the information that's out there and available in the popular culture of what an eating disorder is versus the evidence-based information that's out there. Get that in their hands as quick as possible, the good information, and they'll make better decisions, and they will fight it like you're fighting cancer. I'd like to talk about um, dealing with your child who's over 18. Um, some parents have said, well, what kind of leverage do I have or control? And um, my daughter uh, will always be my daughter. We've expressed that to her, that we would help her um, and support her in, in her any kind of difficulty she was having forever because she will forever be our child. That does not mean that we are not pushing her towards independence. Uh, that's what we hope for her and we work towards that. Um, so I think a parent has a lot of leverage with a, a, an older adolescent or, or a young adult. Um, she doesn't have to have keys to a car if she's not um, working towards her own health and, and, and working it in, in concert with us. Um, she doesn't have to go to college. She doesn't have to be allowed to go be with friends. You know, we have a lot of leverage. So uh, we have money, we have a lot, we have our, our credit card, and she doesn't have her own. Um, so that, that, that's very, very important to me. I want to express that. And, uh, and she's, she's fine with that. I mean, it, she, she understood it. She believed us. She believes us that, um, that she, you know, that we're working together and we'll always be t helping her. Um, okay, I guess that's it. And then the other thing I just want to reiterate is making sure that your, your goal weight is, uh, is the optimal weight. And, and, and then also we have been talking about food and eating and recovery from, from an eating disorder. And I just want to mention that many of our children have comorbid uh, disorders and, illness and conditions and that we, will, we have to address those also. This is not usually, an eating disorder is not usually um, in isolation. It can be, but um, so if we haven't touched on that, I just want to say that we have to address that also. And we, we have personally, and I assume most parents and families have. Uh, just to follow up on sort of what's not touched um, and what wasn't expressed to me initially, and if I hadn't had the form or I hadn't heard from parents, I would have, I think, um, had a lot more difficulty with this. Uh, we saw a lot of physical aggression with my daughter, um, quite extreme physical aggression directed towards me to the point where um, I, I was bruised, I didn't feel particularly safe, and it was fine when she was very low weight um, because I, I, I was able to carry her and hold her, but as she put weight on, um, I felt fearful. And I had a lot of shame over that initially. I mean, here was my 11 year old who hadn't acted like this, uh, and I had a hard time expressing that to clinicians until I realized that it was normal and it was part of the illness. So I think um, normalizing that and addressing it to parents because it may not be something that they raise. Uh, and two, also there was a lot of talk initially around with my clinicians originally before we were connected to the eating disorder specialist around the food pieces, but not around the other behavior that we would see. Um, and I think that was important to be named for parents. So, because we thought saw things that weren't necessarily related to food, but it was clearly eat, now I can look back and say it was eating behavior. But in terms of moving us forward and interrupting symptoms, there were things that I didn't even think to, to, to do. Like the fact that she kind of got obsessed about makeup and I thought, well, I'll deal with this food stuff and I'll deal with this clothes stuff, but I won't deal with that. And I realized it was taking us a long time and I had to deal with everything and it was all ED related. And I hadn't thought, been thinking about it that way at first. So I want to thank our parent panelists. Um, we really appreciate your uh, participating. Um, we want to thank FEAST for um, their support and um, helping us put this panel together. And I uh, want to thank um, AED for sponsoring this. And um, thank you to all our participants.